Okay, good evening everybody. Good evening to all our friends out in Zoom land as well. Um, I'm Associate Professor Garth Bratton, uh, one of the historians at the Strategic Event Defence Study Centre. Welcome to our most recent uh, the FAS series of War Study Seminars. Tonight I'd like to welcome our friend and colleague uh, Malia Hampton, uh, who was a graduate of the University of Adelaide where she completed her PhD exploring the 1916 battles of Pozier and Mouquet Farm. Mel has worked at the Australian War Memorial since 2013 across various functions there, including its magazine Wartime, uh, the last post ceremonies, um, and is currently engaged on some exhibition work as well. Um, she's the author of two books on the First World War, Attack on the Somme, uh, First Anzac Corps, and The Battle of Pozier Ridge, uh, which was released in 2016, and The Battle of Pozier's, uh, which was released in 2018 as part of the Australian Arm Army's campaign study series. Uh, Mel is an ambassador for the Western Front Association. She's currently pursuing further research on First World War operations, in this instance, the two battles of Bully Corps, um, from which her presentation tonight is derived. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Mel to speak to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not as tall as Garth, so I have to stand closer to the microphone. Sorry, people online. Um, let me just find you my... So in uh, May 1917, the Melbourne Illustrated magazine Punch celebrated a great victory by the Australian Imperial Force on the Western Front. It claimed that this battle would be a source of deeper gratification to Australians than Gallipoli, not because the fighting was more heroic, but because it was more successful, because there was a definite gain from it and it sets the Allies a good stride nearer to their goal. To be fair, exactly what the Anzacs did at Bullecourt, we don't yet know. But overall, the press was pretty sure there was an excess of Australian gallantry, bravery, and obviously Anzac traditions. Goodness knows, when posterity reads those pages of history, deeply graven with the deeds of their Australian ancestors, the name Bulacor will send the same thrill of pride coursing through their veins as Gallipoli, El Arish, and Pozier. None of this could be further from the truth, and not just because Jean Bu is the only person in the room who knows what happened at El Arish. The battles of Bulacor on the 11th of April and the 3rd of May 1917 resulted in well over 10,000 Australian casualties for the smallest of gains, and have been credited, rightly or wrongly, with invoking a sense of distrust between Australian troops and their British commanders. More tangible uh, was the... Um, negative legacy of Bulacor, um, totally lost. More tangible was a sense of distrust that the Australian troops felt towards tanks as a result of this experience. Um, and most of this can be comfortably ascribed to the first battle of Bulacor. Many of us will be aware of this uh, battle and during it that the tanks completely replaced any form of artillery fire supporting the infantry attack, like creeping barrage, lifting barrage or anything, the tanks then failed spectacularly, hanging the infantry out to dry. Such was their experience that it took special training the following year before the Australian infantry would consider working with tanks again. The path to Bullock Corps for First Anzac Corps began um, early in the new year of 1917. The War Diary of First Anzac Corps describes a gradual increase of German action in the lines in front of them with increased aerial observation and patrol reports of various new works, patrols and other activities going on on the other side of the wire. The other side of this coin was that the Germans were showing less of a fight when engaged, with this, uh, when engaged during this time. <coughs> So First Anzac Corps War Diary, as early as February 1917, starts to show things like the enemy didn't show a fight, there was very little resistance encountered, and an unusual lack of enemy activity. It soon became pretty clear that the Germans were slowly and silently withdrawing. To where and why was less obvious to First Anzac Corps headquarters. There's an awareness of the Hindenburg Line, but it isn't apparent that they believe this to be a controlled retirement to it for the purpose of staying in it. Part of this is because their own follow-up of the German withdrawal encountered such an uneven response from the enemy. Some patrols could spend hours in no man's land overnight and encounter nobody where others uh, would come across staunchly defended German positions, 
um, and, and not be able to advance. Any pattern we now see where the Germans had a tendency to perhaps hold villages for longer, abandon trench positions systematically, is only with the benefit of hindsight. For those sending young men out for information with the real threat of death before them, this remains unclear for the foreseeable future until May, until May it remains unclear. The process of following up with the, with, with the withdrawal was complicated and stressful and it was awful. Uh, it was winter, it was bitterly cold, the men in the front line were regularly subjected to sleet and frozen, freezing snowstorms while all of this is going on. But they were advancing. There was a chance the trench in front would be unoccupied. This is like, the Germans might be gone, like this is super exciting, it's a super exciting time. The most optimistic of evalu evaluations at the time suggested the Germans were probably on their way to Berlin, like, it's that exciting. Um, but even the most measured commentator could not help but feel the Germans were moving back because of something the Allies were doing. This looked like a lot like victory was on the horizon and it was being caused by the Allies and there's a great deal of latent optimism around. There are a lot of parallels to be drawn between the Buller Corps battles and First Anzac Corps action on the Somme the year before and obviously I'd be remiss if I didn't draw at least some of them. As with the year before, First Anzac Corps was operating as part of the BES 5th Army, which was at the time known as Reserve Army. Its commanding officer was Lieutenant General Sir Hubert Goff, an impetuous, aggressive, ambitious, and generally grossly optimistic commander. He's very unlikable. Even British historians struggle to like him or redeem him in any way. Goff had demonstrated the previous year that perhaps the most important attribute of it, any of his subordinates could show him was <coughs> initiative. Initiative in aggression. In 1916, in the midst of activity on the left flank on the Somme, Goff issued a memorandum that asked Corps commanders to push on. They were to, and I quote, impress upon their subordinate leaders the necessity for the energetic measures and offensive action which the present situation requires. In Goff's terms, there is a situation, so it always requires this. And they would do that by having subordinate commanders think out and suggest enterprises instead of waiting for orders from above. Any territorial gain could result, in, and it could result in an ongoing advance in Goff's estimation. As long as all units would, again I quote, press the enemy constantly and continue to gain ground as rapidly as possible. Nothing has changed with Goff's attitude in 1917 and he is just as quick to rush into operations again. In fact, he was in his element in this hectic, really strange period of time. This began less than six months after the fighting at Mukay Farm had ended and it was proving Goff right, like pressing the enemy as they withdrew, was resulting in ground gained. So, I mean, it could be more accurate to say that pushing up close to the enemy's positions meant that ground recently surrendered by retiring troops could be more quickly occupied, but that is just the negative way of looking at it. They were winning, like this is ground gained. Goff was right. Even the commanding officer of First Anzac Corps, Lieutenant General Sir William Birdwood became enthusiastic about the progress and the success of his vigorous patrolling. This is a man who um, I'm quite happy to tell you was a fairly weak sort of leader. Um, was someone who wanted to look successful without doing very much and really this situation suits him very well. His subordinate leaders could think out and suggest the patrols and he could take all the glory as a result. By late March 1917 the tempo of operations had built up enough that a larger scale operation was needed to advance. This usually meant a battalion or two attacking a garrisoned village that the Germans were slow to leave. And with this came solid hints that the vigorous patrols of before were not going to result with this in the same measure of success. On the 20th of March, a couple of battalions attacked Naroyal with less than four hours warning, I might add, through heavy rain and snow and under heavy machine gun fire. Three officers and 28 men were killed and as many as 200 others were wounded or missing at the end of the operation and Naroyal remained out of reach. This failed attack was a clear warning that attacks similar to the recent ad hoc operations under patchy artillery cover that were no longer going to work and that there was a good chance that the villages ahead would, would in fact be more strongly defended. 
And of course, the Allies had not been simply sitting around waiting for the Germans to withdraw to the Hindenburg Line either. Well before the retirement began, senior officers of the Allies had been planning a major offensive for 1917, which we now know as the Battle of Arras. Following the dismissal of the Commander-in-Chief of the French Horse Forces, Marshal Joseph Joffre, in 1916, his replacement, General Robert Nivelle, uh, uh, planned an attack on German positions along the Chemin de Dam Ridge and the Aisne River. In support of this operation, the British Expeditionary Force was to conduct a series of attacks around the French town of Arras, starting a week earlier, and striking to the east to hopefully meet up with the French attack as it advanced. While the plan saw difficulties in execution due to disruptions caused by the German withdrawal, its essence was kept. Obviously, hindsight shows sweeping infantry movements followed by a cavalry breakthrough was not to be. Nevertheless, the first days of the campaign saw some success, notably and memorably, I guess, at Vimy Ridge on the 9th of April 1917. By the time the Battle of Arras ended in mid-May, however, there hadn't been much else going on. The role of Fifth Army was the role Fifth Army was to play during the Battle of Arras was much the same as that had played at the Battle of the Somme several months earlier. In 1916, that meant activity on the left flank of the Somme in support of Fourth Army's operations. And during the Battle of Arras in 1917, it means on the right flank, and it barely makes it onto the map. While this is not exactly a sideshow, it's nowhere near central to the campaign, and it's really easy to carve Bullecourt out and look at it separately, which is what Australian historians tend to do and what I am tending to do harder this evening. The situation as we reach the first Battle of Bullecourt is that first Anzac Corps has been following up the German withdrawal, feeling pretty good about how things are going, despite the weather, and they are poised to attack. They are under command that is ready for them to attack whenever they feel like it, and uh, coordination is a lovely thing to have, but not necessarily not necessary for success in the eyes of the most senior commanders. And so the time has come for Goff to use First Anzac Corps and get his own stunning success. The plan for First Bullock Corps was to pinch the village out, Is that the way they term it, or squeeze it out or pinch it out by attacking to the right while the British 62nd Division was to attack to the left, and it was to be launched the day after Vimy Ridge on the 10th of April. The 4th and 12th Australian Infantry Brigades were assigned the task, and artillery barrages to cut the wire in front of the Australian line began in earnest around the 8th of April. Such was the mood of the time that it was considered a distinct possibility that the task could still be accomplished by strong patrols. And while preparations went on as though a full operation was required, the 4th Australian Division pushed forward a program of vigorous patrols just in case they got the job done instead. This was ostensibly to make sure that the attacking force could form up unobserved, but battalion commanders were told uh, the fact that limited the fact that limited objectives were laid down is not, not intended absolutely to restrict subordinate commanders if they see a chance of making a little more ground, for our chances of success are greater if we act boldly while the enemy is disorganised. Of course, in case of their butts not being covered, the isolated attachments pushing forward beyond support must be avoided, but, so do it, but not super hard, so, but do it, and if it goes wrong, it's not our fault, is generally the way that works. The preliminary artillery bombardment was an, in, was an integral part of the plan for First Bullock Corps, and it was heavy. In fact, there were no limits on ammunition expenditure other than what it was physically possible to drag up to the guns and fire away. From there, the artillery was to support the infantry through the means of a lifting barrage during the operation. Oh, a lifting barrage during the operation. It was, yes, First Bullock Corps was supposed to take place under an artillery barrage. In fact, it looked a lot like the plans for Pozier less than a year earlier. The infantry was to be organised into three waves to capture three objectives in a limited objective set piece leapfrogging operation of a pretty standard variety for First Anzac Corps. Yet today we know that the battle failed with extremely heavy casualties because the artillery wasn't used and instead was replaced by tanks. So how did this happen? Um, I would like to introduce you to someone you possibly have never heard of, Major William Henry Lowe Watson. <laughs> 
hang on, no, I would never portray someone as a one-dimensional villain for the purposes of getting a few cheap laughs. This is hidden. William Watson was the son of Reverend Patrick Watson of Earlsfields in the UK, a young history graduate from Oxford, so we should be all right. He enlisted early in the war and was posted to the Royal Engineers as a dispatch rider. He transferred to the cyclists and then in late 1916, he joined the heavy branch of the Machine Gun Corps, which is where the tanks were being kept. Tanks, Watson thought, and I quote him, were coloured with the romance that had long ago departed from the war. He began his training in late December 1916, having been given command of number 11 company of D Battalion on his arrival to the Tankerdrome. He'd risen from the rank of corporal on enlistment to major by this time. Watson and his company began their training with drill, something that he had originally regarded as completely unnecessary, but now as a commissioned officer, he quite liked. There were so few tanks available that they couldn't actually use them for their training, however. And so towards the middle of February, after plenty of drill, they were provided with dummy tanks made of canvas stretched over a wooden frame. This is, uh, this is not what was used, but may provide a useful visual as I read Watson's own words, his own account of his training. I quote, imagine a large box of canvas stretched on a wooden frame without a top or a bottom, about six feet high, eight feet long and five feet wide. Little slits were made in the canvas to represent the loopholes of a tank. Six men carried and moved each dummy, lifting it by the cross pieces of the framework. For our sins, we were is issued with eight of these abortions. We started with a crew of officers to encourage the men and the first dummy tank waddled out of the gate, literally waddled. It was immediately surrounded by a mob of che cheering children who thought it was an imitation dragon or something out of a circus. It was led away from the road to avoid hurting the feelings of the crew and to safeguard the ears and morals of the young. After colliding with the corner of a house, it endeavoured to walk down the side of a railway cutting. Nobody was hurt, but a fresh crew was necessary. It regained the road when a small man in the middle, who'd been able to see nothing, stumbled and fell. The dummy tank was sent back to the carpenter for repairs. We persevered with those dummy tanks. The men hated them. They were heavy, awkward and produced much childish laughter. In another company, a crew walked over a steep place and a man broke his leg. The dummies became less and less mobile. The signalers practiced from them. And they were used by the visual training experts. One company commander mounted them on wagons drawn by mules. The crews were tucked in with their Lewis guns and each contraption, a cross between a fire engine and a triumphal car and a Lord Mayor's show, would gallop past targets which the gunners would recklessly endeavor to hit. Finally, these dummies reposed, in our derelict, reposed derelict in our courtyard until one by one they disappeared as the canvas and wood were required for ignobler purposes. They didn't disappear because they got tanks to train in, for the record. One of the few times they were able to play with real tanks, as Watson himself put it, man after my own heart, one of the tank commanders badly ditched his tank in front of senior officers and it then caught on fire. Major William Watson, a number 11 company of D Battalion Heavy Branch Machine Gun Corps, was ordered to take his tanks to support 1st Anzac Corps in its operation near Bullacor on the 10th of April 1917. Major William Watson was also under the impression that 5th Army was rather short of artillery for its part in the Battle of Arras. Charles Bean later wrote that Watson worked out I'm quoting, for his own satisfaction, a surprise concentration in which his tanks massed on a narrow front ahead of the infantry should steal up to the Hindenburg line without a barrage. As they entered the German trenches, down would come the, the barrage under cover of which, and assisted by the tanks, the infantry would sweep through. That's lovely because he's, got, he's perceiving a problem with the amount of artillery and he's thinking about it. You want your officers to think about these workout ideas and, you know, taking re-evaluation, learning, development. Watson, however, took it one step further. He took his plan and presented it to the army commander, Herbert Goff, Hubert Goff. Remember, this is a man who has completed no more than three months of farcical training in a new technology that he had not seen before he arrived at the Tankerdrome at the end of, like, just after Christmas, 1916. 
no doubt his experience planning numerous attacks on the map in the classroom under the gaze of a colonel, which he describes in his training in his memoirs, was for him more than enough to come up with an effective plan. This plan is delivered into an atmosphere of excitement and optimism. This is exactly the sort of thing that Hubert Goff loved, a subordinate commander thinking out, suggesting enterprises that holds the promise of success that he's never heard of before, but it's going to get one over on everyone. He gave him full permission to implement his plan within 24 hours. That is, even as the orders for the artillery barrage I showed you earlier were being typed out, they were being wiped away and replaced by the tank plan. That barrage never disappears from orders, it just doesn't appear on the day. Uh, even Watson was a bit taken aback, but not at all daunted, he's good, he's going to be fine. At 12.30am on the 10th of April 1917, First Anzac Corps messaged the Australian Division to say, under Army orders, action will be taken on the 10th instant. As verbally arranged, tanks will proceed under advance. Will proceed advance. The attack was to begin at 4.30 a.m., four hours later. It's not clear when the verbal orders were issued, but at some point on the afternoon or more likely the evening of the 9th of April. Nevertheless, the battalions of the 4th and 12th battalions conducting the attack were able to reach their jumping off positions in time and lay out under the snow, sleet and rain waiting for the tanks to arrive. They did not. Instead, the tanks became lost in the darkness and a heavy snowstorm. Once it became clear that they would reach the jumping off point position in broad daylight instead of in the pre-dawn light as planned, the attack was called off. The men remained out on their lines until the dawn, until full daylight. And they were fortunate in their journey back that the snowstorm concealed their movements otherwise so they suffered fewer casualties than might otherwise be expected. After having lain out in the terrible weather for several hours though, they were described as considerably exhausted. This was an ignominious start to this great tactical experiment. And there are other signs available at the time that tanks would not be as effective as hoped as well. On the 9th of April 1917, 48 tanks had been used in 1st and 3rd Army's operations. None of the eight tanks assigned to 1st Army managed to keep up with the infantry due to the condition of the ground and became ditched, hung up on, on obstacles. The eight tanks accompanying 17 Corps of 3rd Army were able to launch their attack, but at least four ditched quickly and another two were put out of action by shell fire. Worse, of the 16 tanks assigned to 6 Corps, five failed to reach the starting point in time and one suffered from engine trouble, breaking down altogether after they managed to coax it across the line. The rest of the tanks were again ditched on obstacles or hit by artillery fire and put out of action. And the story of the tanks with 7th Corps is similar. In fact, the tanks were so ineffective that the entire report put forward by the Tank Corps in the wake of this offensive was more or less a, deta a detailed list of ditchings, mechanical failures and destruction. Of those tanks reported to have reached the enemy's line, there is almost no mention of their activity, except in the case of the few tanks with seven corps, which reportedly caused the Germans to surrender freely at the sight of them. Nevertheless, for Fifth Army, about to use these tanks as the central part of their operation, the more important news to find out from other armies about their use of tanks was that the total number of tanks available to them was reduced by 83% on the first day by ditching alone. Any form of inquiry made to 1st or 3rd Armies in the two days between their attacks and that conducted by 1st Australian Corps should have made it clear that the tanks were going to have an indifferent role to play at best and could never succeed at the role 5th Army had for them. Nevertheless, there was no question that the attack on Bullock Corps would be launched again the day after the abortive attempt of the 10th of April, or that, they would, or that there would be little or any modification to the plan. At least the 24 hour delay allowed for the tightening of artillery preparations, uh, but the tanks continued to provide the only source of overarching firepower support to the infantry attack. And um, yeah, there was mo very moderate artillery cooperation and the delay allowed the guns to register on their targets on the flanks more effectively. 
the heavy artillery was to continue to shell German positions around Bullecourt, Riencourt, uh, Caen, albeit with no increase on their nighttime rate of fire, from the start of the operation. While at 4.45, some 15 minutes after the operation was scheduled to begin, the field artillery would lay barrages on the flank. The infantry and their tanks were to have half an hour to reach the village of Bulacor, um, and at which time the bombardment of that village was to stop to allow four tanks to enter and mop up. After a further 15 minutes, the bombardment of Riencourt was to stop and again to allow another tank or two and some infantry to enter. The infantry were given an option to contact the artillery for SOS fire on targets which were hindering the advance, but overall this plan divorced the artillery from the activity on the infantry of, from the activity of the infantry on all but the grossest of scales. It was in no way reflective of the most recent applications of firepower in the advance as exhibited by the British forces. Once determined, the role of the tanks in the attack at Bullecourt never changed. They were to advance in front of the infantry, launching the attack at 4.30 a.m. The hopes for the efficacy of the tanks among lower level commanders was great. They, the Australian brigades were told that, hmm, on, re, on, sorry, no, sorry, on reaching the trenches, um, as soon as they have occupied them, the tanks will display a green disc, meaning come on. As soon as the signal is given, the infantry will advance and seize their objective. Subsequently, two tanks will deal with Bullecourt. How 12 tanks were to occupy a series of trenches remains obscure, although it is to be presumed that the orders mean to empty them of enemy ready for the infantry to occupy them. There is also no contingency mentioned for when the infantry failed to distinguish the green discs from any distance in the pre-dawn light slash impending snowstorm. The 4th Australian Division, Divisional Commander, Major General William Holmes, had had enough warning of an impending attack on Bullecourt that he'd been able to personally carry out a thorough reconnaissance of the front. But his plans to attack uh, Bullecourt head on were quashed from above. And he was told about the plan to squeeze out the village. At 3.05 on the morning of the 11th of April 1917, 11 of the 12 tanks on 5th Army's front were reported to be in position. At 4 a.m., the infantry confirmed they were in position as well. As a result, at 4.30 a.m., the operation could begin precisely on time. This would be the last success of that operation. While all 11 tanks, all 11 available tanks started on time, noticing one didn't make it already. Two were knocked out in the village and the other two returned shortly afterwards damaged. Two reached the Hindenburg line itself but were knocked out by shell fire as they waited for the infantry to catch up. Two tanks were reported to have cleared Riencourt with about 200 Australian infantry um, but as a strong German counterattack captured the lot and this is an example of that super optimism reporting that that probably happened. In fact, this is one of those two tanks which, despite reports, was put out of action near the German lines and then abandoned. That is Germans with that tank. Holmes suggested that the party only got to within 150 yards of the of Riencourt before being made prisoners and didn't actually make the village itself. He also suggested that only one tank reached the Hindenburg line where it was immediately put out of action. It, he added in his report, um, that it, it is doubtful whether any tank passed the Hindenburg line, although one was reported being observed going towards Hendecourt. Although the fate of all the tanks was not confirmed at the time, it was certain that shell fire accounted for knocking out at least six of them, with another two or three badly damaged by it. Only one tank is recorded as returning safely, and so the use of tanks was a disaster. The tank plan had failed. What then of the unprotected infantry? They had moved off their jumping line at 4.45 into heavy machine gun and rifle fire that had not been diminished or suppressed in the slightest by these tanks. Within a short distance, they encountered swathes of uncut barbed wire along most of the attacking front, which again had not been smashed by the tanks or even by artillery in the preparatory bombardments. The men of the two brigades pulled apart, leaving a gap which never closed in the middle, 
and which was a continual source of worry and danger to both brigades during the operation. The flank bombardments of the artillery were light and tentative as be at best, as there was ongoing conflicting information as to the location of the Australians on the ground. And as a result, the Germans were able to deliver repeated counterattacks on both flanks of the attack and through the gap between the brigades as well. Somehow, despite all of these problems and in the face of very heavy casualties, some of the Australian infantry managed to advance and report the capture of the first two objectives of the operation. The third remained beyond reach due to heavy casualties and a determined enemy resistance. Those in the objectives obtained were under constant attack and Australian reports indicate fierce bomb fighting took place from the moment our men entered the captured position. Unceasing German machine gun fire from Riencourt and Bullecourt cut down every attempt to supply these positions with bombs or small arms ammunition, and it became increasingly difficult to hold on. Sometime after 11 a.m., yet another strong German counterattack began to force the Australian infantry back. At 11.20 a.m., Lieutenant Ahrens of the 16th Battalion risked his life by running through the machine gun barrage to give first-hand information on the situation in the forward lines, which had remained obscure. He reported that at least 25% of the brigade were casualties, the bombs had run out, the Germans were now threatening the Australian line, and they were on all sides. It was clear that their position was untenable and by noon, a general retirement was in progress under cover of a light artillery barrage. Major General Holmes did not hold back his opinion of what caused the failure, the tanks and pretty much the tanks alone. Owing to the tanks giving no assistance whatever to the infantry, he wrote, the latter had to advance under heavy machine gun fire across open ground and clamber over wire which was in many places quite undamaged. This caused heavy casualties and the troops, when they reached their objectives, were in considerable confusion and very reduced in numbers. The performance of the infantry, he wrote, who went forward unaided against a strongly wired line and captured it and held it for seven hours, speaks for itself. Holmes' vitriol was echoed in a report written by two battalion commanders of the 4th Infantry Brigade, Lieutenant Colonel Edmund Drake Brockman of the 16th and Lieutenant Colonel John Peck of the 14th Battalions. They wrote that this was one of the most heroic achievements by any body of troops. Unlike Holmes, however, they did not view the artillery cooperation sympathetically either, adding, unaided by artillery, forsaken by tanks on which so much depended, the brigade crossed formidable unbroken wire and secured both objectives, which they held onto for seven hours, and only then forced to retire owing to the overwhelming numbers of the enemy, numerous casualties, shortage of bombs with no immediate hope of getting more up, and hesitating cooperation from the artillery. The tank cooperation, they said, was useless, or worse than useless, and in their fury they even attacked the crews themselves claiming that they had no idea that, that what they were there to do, that personal safety and comfort seemed their sole ambition. The whole outfit, they said, showed rank inefficiency and in some cases, tank crews seemed to lack British tenacity and pluck and that determination to go forward at all costs, which is naturally looked for in Britishers. While Australian fury over the failed attack, attack at Bullocor was aimed directly at the tanks, the tank corps, the heavy branch machine gun corps, it was, as it was then known, itself wasn't especially happy with events either. Initial plans had been for the tanks to work behind the infantry to assist with mopping up, with both arms working forward under the cover of a lifting artillery barrage. Fifth Army had turned this on its head by removing the barrage altogether and putting the tanks in front of the infantry to take out the strong points first. The report from Heavy Branch notes that uh, the whole operation from a tank point of view was a makeshift. It possessed little or no power of endurance or coordination and no means was possible of turning to our advantage the accidents of battle once the tanks had been launched. There were far too few tanks to effectively undertake the role they'd been assigned and there was no reserve available, factors which were very clear to tank corps commanders. The failure at Bullecourt demonstrated what many at Heavy Branch already knew, namely that the tanks struggled to work over heavily shelled ground and that they should be deployed in depth rather than being strung out across the front in penny packets. 
Furthermore, it was considered that tanks should never precede the infantry, which was borne out in that their general lack of mobility meant they should never operate, should never even have been outside of the artillery barrage. Bullock Corps had reflected very badly on their new unit and it stung heavy branch that, that they themselves had nothing to do with this. Well, very little to do with it. The two Australian brigades that fought at First Bullock Corps suffered some 3,300 casualties in that seven hours. Around 1,170 Australians were taken prisoner in the operation, which would be the largest number captured in a single engagement during the war. No ground was held and the 4th Division was withdrawn to Albert to recover. It would be lovely to say that there were some solid lessons learned here and perhaps even some blame apportioned. However, it was not to be. Watson, the, arch Watson, the architect of 5th Army's tank plan at Bullecourt, later called it a minor disaster and claimed that, and I quote, the Australians in the bitterness of their losses looked for scapegoats and found them in my tanks, but my tanks were not to blame. He never really identified where the fault was to be found, although he vaguely added, I have heard a lecturer say that to attack the Hindenburg line on a front of 1,500 yards without support on either flank was a bit rash. Somehow, the absolute failure of the tanks and the resulting catastrophic infantry attack also escaped the highest levels of command. General Hugh Ellis, the officer in commanding the heavy branch, Machine Gun Corps apparently responded to the reports of battle by saying, this is the best thing the tanks have done yet. And Goff sent a message to Watson to say, the army commander is very pleased with the gallantry and skill displayed by your company in the attack today. And the fact that the objectives were sub subsequently lost does not detract from the success of the tanks. Watson celebrated his success with a little holiday in Amiens. And as a result, that had lasting consequences for the conduct of the war as far as the Australians were concerned. And um, they re flatly refused to work with tanks into the ongoing future. And so I found that an interesting um, example of perhaps the way that ongoing technology was not applied evenly and certainly went a great deal backwards. Thank you very much.